If you are saved, if you're clinging on to that hope of salvation, if you're putting faith in that, if you're holding on to the promises that Jesus has given to us through Scripture, He is very interested in your life. He that is down needs fear no fall. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. Let's humble ourselves to the Lord. Let's submit to what the Lord has called us to do. And let the Lord be the guide of our lives so we personally don't have to fear the fall of our pride. Appreciate that, man. It is a, uh, it's an honor to be with you guys tonight. Honestly, it's been a few years, a few years since I uh, officially retired from youth ministry. I had some PTSD as I came in tonight. As uh, oh, hey, hey, hey. I thought, I thought somebody said all nighter. I almost ran right out of the door. Um, no, but honestly, it really is an honor. And um, and uh, you know, it, it was kind of a last minute kind of a last minute decision and um and i'm glad the opportunity presented itself it's, a, it's truly a privilege to to share with you and invest in you and uh, let me just say this before we get into god's word uh you guys have an amazing team of leaders uh some of those leaders were were here as leaders when when i was here so they're still here investing in your life uh, way outlasting my time investing in your life and some of them were actually students at times uh when i was a youth pastor like rachel for instance uh pastor mike's wife rachel she was in youth ministry when i first arrived on the scene back in well, 2013, I think. I one child at the time. Uh, I am much older. I felt old then. I feel really old now. I remember I used to ask sometimes uh, when, I would, when I would speak, I'd be like, how old were you guys in 2001? And none of them would be, like, there's probably nobody, none of you are, were alive then, right? 2001? Yeah, that's when I graduated high school. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an idea of, of how ancient I am. But, um, but you guys have a great team. And I, I would encourage you. Make sure, make sure you con- you are encouraging them. Let them know uh, that you're grateful for the investment that they make in your life. Um, I, I'm so happy with the hands that God brought to to pass off youth ministry to, and uh, and to see what God has continued to do, and to get to see it still without actually having to run it, but to be able to see it still and see how God is working in your lives and continuing to to grow you and mature you is is really just a privilege and honor. So tonight uh, I have the privilege of introducing the topic that you're going to be talking about for really the next uh, I believe month or so, and that topic is identity. Uh, this is a big one, right? Like identity is a is a a big thing. In fact, many people struggle with this idea of identity, especially in your teenage years. It's really easy at times to struggle with figuring out and answering the question, who am I, right? Like everybody is trying to answer that question and they're doing different things to answer that question. Who am I? Who likes me? Who's going to be my friend? What am I going to be like? Who am I going to hang out with? All of these kind of identity shaping things that we deal with. And so this is a really, really important topic. And the main idea that we're going to look at tonight and that you're going to explore even more over these next few weeks is this. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, which I hope every single one of you in this place, that is who you are. But if you're not, you're welcome here. And I'm glad you're here. But if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, what does that look like when it comes to identity? And that's this. To be a follower of Jesus, you're going to need to embrace this new identity that Jesus has given you and the calling that you have that goes along with that identity. Like there is a calling that goes along with the identity that you have in Christ. And here's why this is so important. Ultimately, you're gonna, you're going to find your identity in something. Right? Like, repeat what? Your leaders will give you all the answers. If you miss anything, they'll give you all the answers. Classic yeah. Ryan. Classic Ryan. Oh, well, I'll be up here all night. Start over. Yeah, if you have a complaint, uh, Mike at, I'm sorry, keep down, um. <laughs> No, but seriously, you're going to be formed by something. You're going to choose to allow something to form you. And so choosing the right thing to form your identity on, to build your identity on is really, really important. And so before we get into what we're talking about tonight, I want to give you three, uh, three, three false kind of areas, things that often people build their identities on that are the wrong thing to build your identity on. The first one uh, is really, really simple and something that we all have experienced, and that's sin, right? Like we all deal with sin in our lives. Uh, it doesn't, and when I talk about sin, I'm not talking about just the things that you've done wrong. I'm talking also about the sins that have been done against you as well. 
There is a tendency that we have, and maybe you've never struggled with, but I know many people who have, who, who define themselves by the bad decisions that they've made. And they'll struggle and they'll say things like, well, I'm never going to change. I'm always going to be this person. I'm always going to struggle with this thing, right? And so they'll just kind of allow their sinful choices, the wrong things that they have done, to define their lives. And they just kind of carry that sin as, as kind of who they are. Or, or even things that have been done to them. Like how many of you would, would admit we live in a kind of broken world that like you've experienced uh, painful things in your life because of other people's sin. Like you've experienced maybe people gossiping about you. Uh, you've experienced people talking behind your back. You've experienced a broken friendship or relationship. You've experienced maybe uh, a broken uh, family relationship, parents getting divorced. And, and there's times where even the sins that we've experienced and that have have been a part of our story, we can define ourselves by those things as well. And, and we got to make sure and be careful that we're not allowing the things that we've done or the things that we that have been done to us to define us, to define our identity. Another one is culture. Uh, culture is number two there. Now, culture is something that that it has the ability and the tendency to try to shape your identity. If you didn't know this uh, culture in our culture, it's constantly trying to get you to align with a certain set of beliefs and values that they would say are the truth. And oftentimes the cultures, what, what the culture defines as truth and right is a lot different than what God says is truth and right. And you have to always be on your guard that you're not allowing culture. And listen, Pastor Mike is going to talk more about this, so I'm not going to get into this very much. But let's just think about some of the some of the things that you that you see in culture sometimes that are that are constantly being kind of pushed on you to define identity. Things like gender, things like the the, the world's view of sex and marriage, things like where you find your purpose and what makes you valuable, and what you should chase after in life, right? At least you chase after things that are all about you. And, and I, I don't even know what the statistic was anymore, but there was a time where they people they asked people what they wanted to be. And uh, many people in your generation, the number one thing they said they wanted to be was an influencer. That's what they, they wanted to be famous on YouTube. Why? Because we're told that if you just chase after your own fame, and you chase after your own glory, and, and you just live for yourself, and it's all about being famous and loved and everybody knowing you, and it's a different idea that culture often tries to shape us and form our identity. And the last one, and, and, and before we move on to this third one, this is what the Bible says. And this is why we need to be careful that we're on guard when it comes to allowing culture to shape our hearts. And the Bible says it like this in Romans 12 too, And you might be familiar with this verse. It says this. It says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. So what does he say? You have a choice. You can choose to conform to the world's set of values, which is very different than God's values. You can choose to look and act and think and do everything like the world says to do, the culture says to do, or you can choose to define yourself by who God says you are. And the only way you can do it, he says, you can either conform or you can be transformed. And the way that starts is by allowing God to transform the way you think, right? It starts up here. So he says, allow God to do a work of transformation in your thought life. And then the third thing. So we have sin. We have culture. Number three, we have Satan. The Bible is clear that we have a very, very real enemy. That, that The Bible says that God loves us. He has a plan for your life. That he's come to give you life and life abundant. But in the same verse, it says that we have an enemy that has come to steal, to kill, to destroy. That he has come to distort God's truth. He wants nothing more than to rob you from experiencing God's best. If he can confuse you when it comes to your identity, if he can make you live a life where you're constantly confused and you never have any confidence in who God has called you to be, that's a win for him. Right? Like he's going to do everything possible to throw things in your way. The Bible says it like this in 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. It says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. He's constantly looking for people that he can pick off one by one. He's constantly looking for ways that he can, that he can kind of find his way in and begin to plant seeds of confusion. The Bible says that he's the great accuser, that he's the deceiver, that he's the father of all lies. And so when he speaks lies, he's speaking his native language, his native tongue. And so he's constantly kind of just prowling around, looking for ways to influence your life, looking for ways to distort God's truth and to build, and to build your identity on something other than who God has called you to be. And so what does it say? The Bible says that in those verses, it says, what do you need to do? Then you need to make sure that you're standing firm in your faith. 
You need to make sure that you're building your life on a right foundation. You need to make sure that you're not letting your, your guard down, that you're being careful and you're protecting yourself when it comes to your identity. And here's the thing. These things that we just talked about, and there's probably other ones we could talk about as well, but these things are going to be at war with the identity that God has called you to form. And they're going to be at war with, with the identity that, that you need to be forming and building your life on. And so I, I have two kind of main ideas I want us to talk about tonight when it comes to your identity. And hopefully, like I said, these will get explored even more throughout these next few weeks. But the first one is this, if you're taking notes. Real simple. Your identity, it starts with knowing whose you are. Not who you are, whose you are. Your identity starts with knowing whose you are. Knowing who you are starts first by understanding who you ultimately belong to. Now the Bible says when we give our lives to Christ, and you surrender your life to Jesus, you put your faith in Him, that you are brought into the family of God. At one point in time, you're God's creation. We're all God's creation, but we're not all God's family. When you put your faith into Jesus, though, he says he he brings you into his family. This is some verses and it talks all about this throughout scripture. But John chapter one, verse 12 says, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. First John three, the first part of verse one says, see how much the father loves us for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. You know, something changes in our lives and and I think will change in your life when you begin to really fully grasp and understand your identity as a child of God. That the creator of the universe who knows everything about you, knows every secret that you think you can keep from everybody else, he knows. Every sin that you think you can hide from everybody else, he knows. Every time you erase your internet search history, he knows, right? All those things, the things you struggle with when nobody else is looking. He knows all of those things. And guess what? He still loves you. He still adopts you into his family. He still calls you his, his child. And he wants you to know him as your, fa- as your father, your perfect heavenly father. Have you ever really thought about that? Have you ever really just taken time to rest in the fact that you're God's child? H- how many of you have ever seen that movie Overcomer? Anybody see that movie Overcomer? It's kind of a, I don't know, it's a somewhat newer kind of faith-based movie. But I'm going to just spoil it for you. But watch it anyway. Um, we watched it actually last night with our kids. Uh, we've watched it before. I actually watched it the night before, and Tiff fell asleep on the couch. And then last night we watched it again with our kids. And um, and, and that was like our third time watching it. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm kind of a baby when it comes to any sports movies. Like, remember the Titans? That's an older one, probably you don't remember. But yeah. I'll cry during I'll be like, I'm not crying, it's a sports movie, right? I don't know why. And this one's kind of a kind of based on a sports movie too but the underlying theme is that there's this girl named hannah and uh she lives with her grandmother and the reason she lives with her grandmother is because uh her mom passed away and her dad kind of abandoned her because they had drug issues but her grandmother told her that her dad was dead so she grew up living her life she's a teenager now living her life thinking that both of her parents were dead and that she has nobody that really loves her except for her grandma but she still struggles you can just tell she struggles with her identity she's constantly like stealing stuff she just doesn't have any confidence in who she is she's real quiet and just just kind of goes through the movie with not a lot of hope in her life and uh she's a cross-country runner that's also has asthma um yeah and so uh, which is not normally something you should do to run cross-country i don't know why you run cross-country period it's just running but whatever um it sounds terrible um but anyway this girl runs cross-country and her coach goes ends up going to the hospital and she meets a guy and this guy ends up being her father and uh and Eventually, they introduce, they, they cross paths, they introduce themselves to, he introduced himself to her. She kind of meets him, but kind of walks out because she doesn't know how to take it because this whole life, her whole life she thought her father was dead and, and she just lived with that heaviness and that weight. And at one point in the movie, the principal of the school talk, starts talking to her about Jesus and talks to her about her perfect heavenly father. You know, imagine your whole life living without this father influence and feeling like you have nobody in your life that loves you as a father. And she, the principal starts talking to her about the perfect heavenly father and she gives her life to Christ and, and, and the principal tells her, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home and I want you to read Ephesians chapter one and two. And I want you to just, as you read Ephesians one and two, I want you to just write down 
everything in Ephesians 1 and 2 that it says that you are now that you're in Christ. Like your identity in Christ. What does it say? And make it personal. I am. What does it say? And so that's what she did. She went through. And as she did this and she began to realize that even though her father, her earthly father wasn't in the picture, she had a heavenly father that loved her, that pursued her. And she began to understand and comprehend all of these things about her identity, which allowed her to eventually forgive her father and to live life free. Because there's something that, that happens in our lives when we grasp that we have a perfect God who doesn't just look at us as his creation or a servant or a slave or even as our sin. He looks at us as his children when we put our faith in Christ. There's something powerful about that, that that I think that if you would just anchor your identity in, you would you would build your life on that foundation of understanding that God is your perfect father, that you belong to him, that that's who that's whose you are. You are God's child. Something powerful that takes place. In fact, some of those things that, that, that are there for us when we are in Christ, I wanted to just share with you. And you probably know some of these things. But these are powerful truths for you to understand that to constantly remind yourselves about of who you are in Christ. Number one, the first thing we are when we are in Christ. You are chosen and adopted. You are chosen and adopted. Those are powerful words I want you to think about. In Ephesians... Where, where, he, where the, the principal told Hannah to look. In Ephesians, it says this in verses 3 through 6. It says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before He made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into His own family By bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son Jesus. What happened last night after we watched this movie is my daughter who was watching my 10 year old daughter. She went home that night that home and she was she was asking for her for her like bigger not her storybook Bible her real Bible. And I knew what she was doing. She wanted to read Ephesians like in the movie. And she, she was laying in bed last night and she was reading it. And she told me today, and I didn't even know she was reading it last night, and she told me today. There was a part that really stuck out to me as I was reading it. I don't really fully understand it, but that part where it says that, I like how it says that God chose us and that he adopted us. And even at her, at her level, she's starting to understand what that means. There's something powerful about knowing that, that God chose you. Now, you may have not ever got picked for a team in school. You might be the last person picked, but guess what? God chose you. He wanted you on his team. He, he did everything possible to bring you in. He had, you know what's amazing about adoption? You don't get to pick who adopts you. Right? Like, you, you don't pick who adopts you. The, the person does the, the, who's doing the adopting picks the, picks the person. That means that God chose you. He adopted you. He literally looked at you and he said, I want that person in my family. I want that person in my family. I want to adopt them and bring them in. The Bible says, not only did he want to do it, but it brought him great pleasure to adopt you in. To bring you into his family. There's something amazing about understanding that God chose us. Number two, not only are you chosen and adopted, you're forgiven and redeemed. We talked about in the beginning how sin has this tendency to define us if we're not careful. Like, right? It has this tendency to, and maybe you don't, maybe you don't allow sin to define you, but there's times if you're honest with yourselves where you hold on to those things and you remind yourselves of the things that you know God has forgiven you from, but you can't forgive yourself from. Right? Have you ever done that? You you just kind of sit there and you think about all the ways that you failed and all these different kind of things and you allow those sins to define you. And and this is where understanding that God has forgiven you and redeemed you is so important because in Christ, your past does not define you. You're forgiven and redeemed. The very next verse in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, it says this. It says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom. That's what that redeemed word means. With the blood of His Son, And he forgave our sins. He canceled the debt that our sins demanded. When you and your, when you are in Christ, you do not have to be held back by your sins. Your past sins do not define you. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, it says it like this. It says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. That word condemnation, that word means to identify you as your sin. It's that voice that when you, when you mess up, it's that voice that kind of comes in right away and starts going, see, I knew you were going to do it again. See, you're just a failure. You're never going to change. How many of you ever experienced? Let's be honest today. We can be honest. 
I, I'm t- I've experienced that many times in my life. I still experience that at times, even as a 38, almost 39, as a pastor. Because I still fall short. I'm old. I thought you were like 28. Wow. You're kicked out. <laughs> I still experience it. That's what that voice is, that voice of condemnation that just kind of comes in and constantly reminds us of our best. You know what the voice of conviction is? That's the Holy Spirit when we mess up. And it's not a voice of shame and guilt. It's a voice that tells us, yeah, you've fallen short, but I still love you. Bring that to me. I will forgive you. I will heal you. I will restore you. And there's a difference. And many of us, the voice that we allow to speak the loudest in our minds is the voice of condemnation, and not the voice of conviction. And then we allow ourselves to define ourselves by our sin. The Bible says, if you are in Christ Jesus... Not if you're perfect, not if you have it all figured out, but if you are in Christ Jesus, you've trusted him for your salvation, the forgiveness of your sins, that there is no longer any condemnation for you who belong to Christ Jesus, that he has given you his spirit and it's a spirit of life, not a spirit of sin and death. In Psalms 103 verse 12, when it talks about forgiveness, it says this, it says he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. So when you're reminded of your sin, it's either you reminding yourselves or the enemy reminding yourselves because the Bible says that God removes our sins. doesn't mean God doesn't remember as in like he has like short term memory problem, right? It means he chooses to not hold your sin over you any anymore. You understand that? You know, the the east and the west, they never they never match up like maybe in a globe, but like if it's on a line, they don't ever come together. That's what he's saying. He says, just like the east and the west never meet. So God has forgotten the sins that you've given. When you've asked him for your forgiveness, he doesn't hold that sin over you anymore. He releases you from the penalty of that sin and he doesn't remember it anymore. So anytime that you're being reminded of sin, that's not the voice of God. That's the voice of the enemy or the voice of guilt that oftentimes we allow for ourselves. What does all this mean? What does all that mean for us when it comes to being forgiven or redeemed? It means this. It means that if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, the new life has begun. Because of who you are in Christ, because you've been adopted into His family, and you've been forgiven of your sins, you're a new creation. You're not a cleaned up version of your old self. You're not like you 2.0. You are a brand new creation in Christ. Your identity is not who you used to be. Your identity is now this child of God, this new creation. God has forgiven you of your sins, past, present, and guess what? In the future as well. Because guess what? You're going to mess up in the future too. And when you've experienced God's forgiveness, He's forgiven you for those sins as well. He paid the price for those sins as well. You don't get resaved every single time you mess up. His grace and His mercy and His forgiveness is bigger than all of your sins. Now, what ends up happening sometimes is people use that as a license to do whatever they want to do, right? Well, God's going to forgive me so I can just live however I want to live. And what I would tell you is you've never truly experienced God's forgiveness because when you really experience God's forgiveness, you don't want to live in that prison of sin anymore. When, when you sin, you know it breaks God's heart and, and you know that it separates you from His presence and you don't want to do anything that will separate you from His presence. It's not a license to continue to do whatever you want to do. What it is is it's freedom to know that even when you mess up, God still loves you. And you can't change his love for you. There, there's nothing you can do to change his love, in which that's the third one I want to talk about. Is not only are you adopted, not only are you forgiven, but you are perfectly loved. One of my favorite scriptures growing up as a teenager was found in Romans chapter 8, in, in verses 38 and 39. And the reason is this. How, how many of you would be honest enough to say that there's times where you struggle with, with understanding God's love for you? I do. There's times where, listen, I've grown up in church, literally. I'm, my, my dad was a pastor my entire life. I've been in church service after church service. There was a time in, in our lives where we literally lived in a house that was connected to the church. I couldn't get away from church. I was in church more times than I wanted to be in church. I, I knew God's love. I knew all about it, but there were still times I really struggled, and, and even now still. And oftentimes when we struggle with, with God's love, is, it's probably those times in our lives where we fall short, right? Where we mess up. We, we, we sin, we do something we know we shouldn't do, and we begin to struggle because we got, I, I mean, I struggle to love myself sometimes. And I think all of us do. And so sometimes we go, I don't even like myself some days. So how could this perfect, holy God who knows me, knows everything about me, knows the ways I've sinned and fallen short, how could he actually love me? And the reason he can love us perfectly is because his love is not based on you. It's not based on me. It's not based on your performance. It's based on Jesus. 
In Romans 8, 38 and 39, a verse I constantly would remind myself about when I was struggling with accepting God's love was this. It says it like this. It says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's love for you is perfectly revealed in Christ, which means this. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you more than he loves you already. Nothing. Which enables, which kind of frees us from that performance mentality where I gotta just earn my way to God. And I gotta constantly do good things to make God love me. And I gotta perform the right way. And then God will care for me and He'll accept me and He'll love me. No. There's nothing you could do to make God love you more than He already loves you. And guess what? There's nothing you could do to make Him love you less than He loves you as well. His love for you was perfectly shown. And even when we were singing about this tonight, and, and sometimes I think we can sing songs and not really think about those words. And some of the words that we were singing tonight are powerful words talking about what Jesus accomplished. Even in a few weeks, we're going to celebrate what Jesus accomplished on the cross for us. When you look at the cross, what, what, what you should see when you look at the cross, when you look at Jesus and you imagine him being beaten and whipped, what you should see is you should see the love of God being poured out for you. You should also see the wrath of God towards your sin, not Not his sin. Jesus didn't sin. The wrath of God towards your sin. The Bible says that he became sin who knew no sin. That you could be right with God. That he took your sin. So think about the sins you struggle with. Think about the secret sins, the hidden sins. The Bible says that he he became those things for you. And when he was beaten and whipped and when he was bleeding out, he wasn't bleeding out for his sins. He was bleeding out for your sins. And when you look at the cross and you think about the punishment that Jesus carried and what he did. Like that is a love for you. That is his passion for you. That is his desire that you would not be bound to your sins, would not be held captive to your sins, but that you would experience his love, his forgiveness, his grace and his mercy in your life. And you would understand who he created you to be. And you wouldn't live and walk through life so confused about your identity and confused about your purpose. But you would know your purpose is found in whose you are. And if you're in Christ, you know that he bled for you. He died for you and he rose again for you as well. You know, I made this really, really practical with my daughter, with my oldest daughter, Layton. Uh, years ago when she was really young, I used to ask her this question. And I did it again a couple of weeks ago because I wanted to see if she remembered. And I used to ask her, I used to go, hey, Layton, do you know why daddy loves you? And she would start th- saying things, well, because I'm silly, I'm funny, you know, like what her little brain thinks at that time, right? Because I'm cute. And she's all those things. And she would go through her whole list of things and I would let her say all the things. And I would say, nope, that's not why. No, no, no. And then she would say, well, why? And I would say, I love you because you're my daughter. I love you because you're my daughter, right? Why? There's nothing that she did to make herself my daughter. She didn't have a say in it. She's my daughter. My love for her is not based on anything she does. My love for her is based on on my love for her. That's it. My love for her is based on who she is. And I think I think I would want us to experience and understand the same thing. That, that his love for you, the reason it's a perfect love is because it's not based on you. It's not based on your performance. It's not based on what you've done or haven't done. It's based on who Jesus is. When you want to know the value of something, you look at what somebody's willing to pay for it. When you look at the cross, you see what God was willing to pay for you. Make it personal. When you look at it, you see what God was willing to pay and to do to purchase your freedom. Now, we could talk about all, all kinds of other things because there's many other things that we are in Christ. If you look through that scripture in Ephesians, you'll see many other ones. It says we're, we're more than conquerors, the Bible says, which means we're victorious, which means that if you're a follower of Christ, you have everything you need to, to be victorious in your walk with Christ. You don't ever have to be held down to sin, that God has given you everything you need to win. That God has given you everything you need to live a life that honors him. Every tool you need, every everything you need, it's in his word. And when you submit to his word and you follow his word, not just read it, but you actually obey what it says, you have everything you need. The Bible says that you're blessed with all blessings. Every blessing you need is found in Christ. But the point is this. In order to embrace your identity as a follower of Christ, it starts with understanding whose you are. Number two, the second thing I want us to see when it comes to identity tonight is this. And, and this is... Your identity, it drives your actions. Your your identity drives your actions. What I mean by that is knowing who you are determines what you do. Your beliefs 
Direct your behavior. This isn't about behavior modification because that's what we do sometimes with religion, right? We, we think about, I'm just going to change the way I act. I'm just going to do better things. I'm going to do more religious things. I'm going to check off all these spiritual boxes and I'm going to, I'm going to be a good moral person. And we think if I do good things, then, then my, my beliefs, you know, my beliefs will line up with my outer works. No, no, no. Your identity, who you are in Christ, knowing who you are and even more than that, whose you are, should have an impact on the way that you live your life, the calling that you you live with. This is all about heart transformation. Because you can have the right behaviors, but still not have a transformed life. But can I tell you something? It's impossible to have a truly transformed heart and for it not to affect the way you live your life. If you are truly transformed and you are allowing God to do a work in your life, the actions of your life are going to change. It, it's, it's just natural. That's what's happened because it's an inner work that God is doing and it plays out in the way that you live your life. And the Bible talks about this in all different ways, but I want to read a couple of scriptures. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 10 says this. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, right? Again, fighting against this idea of behavior modification and religion. So that none of us can boast about it. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. I want you to just say that for a second. I know I don't always do the repeating things, but I want you to say, I am a masterpiece. Go ahead and say it. Just say it out loud to yourself. I am a masterpiece. It's, I mean, I know some of us don't, you say it and you, it's hard for you to believe that, but that's what the Bible says about you. That when you are in Christ, you're a masterpiece. You're a work of art. Why? Because God poured out his grace in you. He did something for you that you did not deserve. The way that God has saved people that are sinners like you and I, that is, it's a miracle. It's the work of our, we're God's masterpiece. And what does he say then? This is why he saved you. He said he saved you so that you could do the good things that he's called you to do. Good works are not what saves us. Good works are what flows out of our life when we understand our identity. When you understand that God saved you, it's not about you. It's not about what you've done. It's not about anything that you could do for yourself. But you understand that he saved you. Then the actions of your life will follow. As you submit and you understand that identity. And here's the thing. Ultimately, the good things that you do in your life, they're not about you anyway. They're not about bringing glory to you. They're not about bringing attention to you. Ultimately, when we are a follower of Christ and we understand our identity, the good things we do are ultimately about pointing other people to Jesus. We want other people to experience what we've experienced. We want other people to be forgiven. We want other people to be adopted. And we want other people to find their identity in their creator. The only thing that has a right to define a creation is the creator of that. We want other people to experience that for ourselves. So we do things because we want to point them towards Jesus. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, Jesus said this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp, then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. He says, listen, this is who you are, right? This is your identity. He says, you're salt. But what does salt do? Salt makes things taste better. How many of you like to put salt on everything? I'm a little, I love salt. That's, that's, is that Spanish salt? That's Spanish salt. We're going to go with it. It's flavor all. I don't know what it is, but yeah. Yeah. What does salt do? Salt, salt enhances. Salt brings out the flavor. Salt also preserves at that time. Salt was used as a preservative. They didn't have refrigeration systems like we have. So they would put salt on food to preserve it. And it also tastes delicious. And here's what he's saying. He says, you are the salt of the earth, which means that God has given you a purpose. And that purpose is to make the world a better place around you to to enhance your, your purpose is to preserve, which means to help people experience Jesus so that they can have eternal life with him. He says, what good is salt if it doesn't do what it was created to do? He says, you're light of the world. You don't light a lamp and throw it under a basket. You don't light a lamp and hide it. Light brings life. Light brings direction. Light brings hope. Light points to, to a hope even in the middle of midst of darkness. We turned all the lights out here and unplugged everything else. And I would light a match. It would be the most attractive thing in here. Right? Because in the, the darker things go, the brighter light shines. And you guys live in a pretty dark world. 
You live in a pretty dark world. Your schools are dark. The culture you live in is dark. But guess what? That is just greater opportunity for you to shine bright. It's just easy. It should be even easier in a lot of ways because if you truly live for Christ, you're going to look different. Your lives are going to look different. You're, you're going to be different than the rest of the culture. And ultimately, it's not about you, right? It says, let your, your good, let your light shine so that people may see your good deeds and it would bring glory to your Father. Our identity is not about us. Our identity is ultimately about Jesus. It's about pointing people to Him. So again, understanding your identity begins with knowing whose you are. And when you know whose you are, you will know what to do. Because your identity directs your actions. Everything flows from your identity. Which means this. Anytime you look at your life, this is really important. Anytime you look at your life, if you're a follower of Christ, anytime you look at your life and you see that the fruit of your life is not good, meaning the things that your life is producing, the things that are flowing out of your life, whether that, that's sinful actions or whatever it is, whatever's flowing, if it's not good fruit, what does that mean? It means that you're, you're struggling in an, with an identity issue in that moment. Because everything flows out of your identity. And so when there's things that are in your life that are not good and you're a follower of Christ, that means at that time, you're not, you're not living in that true identity as a follower of Christ. You're allowing other things... Other outside influences, culture, sin, whatever it is, you're allowing other things to be the thing that that directs your identity. And it's producing things flowing out of your life that are sinful. And so in those moments, we have a choice. We repent. And the question I would ask you, ask you before we move on and before we close is, what are you allowing to shape your identity? What other things are you allowing to shape your identity? And so I want to give you just one really, really, really practical app, application, action step, whatever you want to call it, that, that I want to encourage you to do this week. Okay? Here it is. And this is going to sound simple and obvious. But it's practical for a reason. I want to encourage you to spend time with God, allowing Him to shape your identity. I heard somebody say it like this. They said, our identity is affected less and less by what we produce and more and more by what we consume. And so, practically speaking, the reason some of you struggle so much with your identity, the reason you struggle so much with understanding who God created you to be, is because you spend so little time allowing God to shape you and to mold you into His image, and you spend so much time allowing culture and social media and outside opinions to shape you. And the only way you can truly understand your identity and purpose is by getting to know your Creator. I want to close with one final portion of Scripture, and then we're going to pray. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1-10, through 10, it says this, and this is a longer portion of Scripture, but it's important. It says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights, right? In other words, focus on the right thing. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. It's talking about having an eternal mindset. Living for things that are eternal, not just for the things that are here and now. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, right? And the Bible says when, if you have been crucified with Christ, meaning when he died, that was your old nature dying as well. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. And this is what it says. This is an action. This is, this is, this is a choice right here. Ready? It says, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things, that old creation, when your life was still part of this world. But now, is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior and slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other for you have stripped off that old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. So put on your new nature. I love this illustration because it's very practical. It makes it sound like it's just like changing clothes, right? Like you choose to change out of your old, smelly, dirty clothes and you choose to put on new clothes. Why? Because your new, your new identity is not that person, right? So he says to put on your new nature. Choose to, to, to focus on that new person that God has called you to be. To do things that align with that new nature that God has given you. And be renewed. And it's talking about that, what we talked about earlier in, in Romans 12, right? Don't be transformed, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. This is impossible if you never spend time with Him. It's impossible if the only time that you go to God's Word is on Sunday mornings if you come to church and on Wednesday nights from Pastor Mike or your youth team. 
It's impossible. You will, you will lose that, that identity battle if this is the only times that you are, that you are going into God's word for yourself. And if my 10 year old daughter can go to her word and, and she can draw that out, I guarantee you that God can speak to you through his word as well. So would you close your eyes as we pray and close tonight? With every head bowed and eyes closed, I just want to, first and foremost, I want to say this. And I think this is so important to do. I'm sure Pastor Mike does this as well. And we do it on Sunday mornings as well. But we always want to give an opportunity for somebody who is maybe here and has never surrendered your life to Christ. We talk about all this identity stuff, right? But truthfully, if you've never given your life to Christ and you've never received forgiveness for your sins and you've never surrendered to his his lordship and his leadership in your life, understanding that he is is the one who's in control. And you've never made that decision. You're living right now separated from God. You're allowing everything else to form your identity. And all of these things that we talked about, about whose you are in Christ, those are things that can be yours if you surrender your life to Jesus and you trust him. And so if there's anybody here before we close in prayer that has never made that decision, who would say tonight, tonight I want to begin as a follower of Christ. I don't want to leave this room the same way I came into this room tonight. I didn't even know I was coming in here for any of this. Some friend invited me and told me there'd be games and food and other stuff. And But God has been speaking to you through his word and drawing you to him. It's not me. That's him. And if that's you tonight and you would say tonight, I need to say yes to Jesus and surrender. My, would you just raise your hand really quickly? Nobody's looking around. I see a hand back there. I see a couple hands. Anybody else? I'm just going to wait for a moment. Can I tell you that this is the absolute greatest decision you will make in your entire life? It's the most important decision you will make in your entire life. More important than the career, more important than the person you choose to marry, more important than anything else. Anybody else who would say, tonight I'm saying yes to Jesus. As we close in prayer, I want to just invite you to to speak to God. You don't have to to pray in any certain language or, or, you know, have the appropriate words or feel like you, I don't, I don't know what to say. It doesn't really matter. God doesn't care about those words. He cares about your heart. And in your own heart, I would just encourage you to just ask him to forgive you for your sins and to make you into that new creation that he promises. Now, for the rest of you who are in here, still with every head, head bowed and eyes closed, maybe there's some of you in here who would say that you are a follower of Christ, but if you're honest, you struggle with this identity in Christ. Maybe you've grown up in church and you know all the verses and you know all the things and you have this this mental knowledge of what it means. But that mental knowledge has not ever begun to be lived out in the practical side of living as a new as a new creation in Christ. So you could say you're a follower of Christ, but if you if you're honest, you struggle with believing your in your identity. You struggle with with understanding God's love. You struggle with uh, understanding that he's adopted you, that he's chosen you, that he's forgiven you. You hold on to things. You you identify yourself by other things other than what he says about you. Is there anybody in here tonight who says, yeah, I really struggle with that and I need to surrender that to Jesus and begin to trust in his identity? I'm going to wait for a second. Anybody else? That's you tonight. And you say, man, I am. I'm struggling. And I would encourage you as we go into small groups to talk about that with your small group. Pray for each other. He doesn't want you to to live your life confused about who who you are and who he's called you to be. He wants you to walk in confidence, not in your own confidence. Confidence in him. And there is a difference. So, Father, tonight I thank you for every young person in this room. God, they may not even believe or see anything that you see in them, God. When I look through this world and this room and I hear the stories as I talk to Pastor Mike and other leaders, God, I know that this room is full of, of world changers for you. There is teenagers here who are loving you, who are finding their, their, their identity in you and you alone, God. And you're going to do amazing things in and through their lives. God, I thank you for those Uh, Two or three that raise their hand that are saying tonight they want to surrender their life to you. God, I pray that this would be a monumental night in their life. That they would remember this day in in, in their history, in their lives. That this was the day that they surrendered their life to you. And they drew that line in the sand and they began to walk as a follower of you. I pray for the other ones who raise their hand who say they struggle with identity, struggle with believing in who you say they are. God, I pray that you would renew their mind as they spend time in your word. God, I ask that you would make it come alive to them when they read your promises. God, I pray that they would understand that they are their promises for themselves. And they would build their lives on the foundation of you. God, I thank you for the conversation that's going to take place in small groups. Let it be edifying, challenging, encouraging, and bless the rest of this night as well. Thank you for this opportunity we've had to look at your word together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, Pastor Mike here. 
Thank you for listening to the Morningstar Student Ministry Podcast. Whatever your age, my hope and prayer is that you grow a desire to know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through these messages. For more information about the Morningstar Fellowship Student Ministry, or if you'd like to support the ministry financially, please visit www.mstarqtown.org and search MSTAR Students. God bless and have a great week.